Hello Funkers, Tony Funk here back at it again, and in today's short, I am going to entertain and examine the possibility of OG73 returning and what the implications of that are, as well as a retrospective look on the Moro slash Granola sagas and how they're setting up a saga trilogy, maybe. We'll see. Anyway, let's first explore OG73 as a character before we even dive into the possibility of his return. OG73's first appearance occurs during chapter 50 of the manga. However, he only cameos in a single panel along with Sagambo's crew. His first meaningful appearance occurs during the heist of planet Pui Pui, I mean Zune, in chapter 51, where he, Shimareka, Yunba, and Sagambo murder a group of mostly unarmed guards guarding a treasure chest that's just sitting outside for some reason in the middle of a desolate landscape. Ugh. Toyotara was definitely channeling his inner Rob Liefeld. But anyway, in this incident, we realize that OG73 doesn't really have a personality other than being a subordinate robot when he is instructed to conserve his energy by Sagambo. We finally get some real exposition for 73 in Chapter 53 when Jocko explains some brief lore about 73. Oh wait, not really. He just says he's scary and has a special move everyone must watch out for which is his move-stealing power that can perform the copied person's moves at the same power the person typically would, meaning 7-3 alone could touch an angel and gain their abilities just as Moro later did with Miris. At this point, we kind of expect 7-3 to be doing a little bit more. However, nothing really interesting happens to 7-3 until Moro eats and absorbs him in Chapter 61. Here Moro claimed that by absorbing 7-3, he was able to regain his full strength because he backed his full power up in 7-3, which is why Moro's power boost was off the charts when he ate him. But this revelation seemed pretty impactful if you ask me, because it meant, well never mind, I'll get to that later. Next we go into the Granola Saga, where 7-3 is revealed to have survived Moro's death and subsequently stolen by Master Goichi's men. Well he wasn't really stolen so much taken back. In Chapter 67, we learn that Master Goichi is some kind of mad scientist who is trying to take over the universe using an army of data-saving androids, OG-76, OG-71, etc. We find out that 7-3 sent a distress signal, which was how Goichi knew he was free for the taking. But why did Goichi risk his life if he had other OG units on his ship, which one would assume would have the same powers? Well, it turns out that Goichi was after 7-3's data since it was vastly expanded after he was stolen by Sagambo's men. Coincidentally, Goichi wasn't the only one after 7-3 for his data and was stolen yet again, but by Granola this time and given to the heaters during chapter 68. Using the data acquired, the heaters were able to find Zuno and figure out Goku and Vegeta's weaknesses and yada yada yada. So how could 7-3 possibly come back if he has already served his purpose in the narrative? I mean, he was introduced as a tertiary bad guy after Moro and Sagambo, just so that Gohan and Piccolo could have someone to fight. Then, he was used as a weapon by Moro after he ate him to regain his original powers. And in the saga that came after, his purpose was to help bridge the gap in power between the heaters and Granola, Goku, Vegeta, and of course, Frieza. But hear me out guys, I think there's one last golden egg for 7-3 to lay, considering that two of the heaters are dead, and the other two are now part of Frieza's army. Think about it, Goichi's still alive, and still has 7-3's data, and 7-3 is also still alive, and who knows, maybe he can make another distress signal? I don't know, but I think 7-3 had been purposely injected into the story since the Moro arc to become more than a tertiary bad guy. I mean, this guy had a little more sauce than the secondary villain Sagambo. Okay, so what is this golden egg? Allow me to elaborate. Since the original Dragon Ball manga came out, Akira Toriyama had always incorporated technological MacGuffins as a means to move the plot forward. Whether it be mech suits, androids, time travel, galactic patrol gadgets, etc. And in 7.3's case, Akira Toriyama was trying to use them as a plot USB. What I mean by that is that the common theme about 7.3's usefulness had never been about his power, but about what was saved in his database. Though 7-3 wasn't functionally capable of using every move he'd encounter, it is understood that every power he had ever accessed was somehow still searchable in his operating system. It is not fully understood to which degree those stored powers were accessible, but we know for a fact that 7-3's three last absorbed powers were still in there. 
The three powers he kept were most likely Moro, Gohan, and Piccolo, since I doubt 7-3 would want to keep Mirus's powers in his immediate arsenal considering what happened the last time he tried using Angel powers. So, so far, I've made the argument that 7-3's whole purpose is to be used as a cyber weapon, since that's what his use had been reduced to. I mean, in three different occasions throughout two different arcs, other characters providing exposition about 7-3 alluded to his database as being his most useful quality. The first incident was with Moro, when he backed up his powers in 7-3 in chapter 61. Then in chapter 67, we saw Goichi want 7-3 specifically for his data, and then later, we saw Elec seeking him basically for the same reason. Plus, he actually succeeded in gaining intel that was recorded from his escapades with Sagambo and company. So why is 7-3's type of use important in determining whether or not he will return in the next saga? Well, typically when a character in Dragon Ball has a handy use and is still alive, they are either A. never revisited, or B. revisited 6 sagas in 20 years later. But I think 7-3's case is a little different, and here's why. I think 7-3 has a couple curiosities that coincide with the sagas he has partaken in. I mean, for example, 7-3's introduction was in the Moro Saga, as a minor villain with no personality of his own, yet he still persisted towards the end and ended up being in the subsequent saga to be used as a plot device for the main villains. But hold on a second, that was his use in the Moro Saga as well. Sure, we can place our bets that they won't have any relevance in the upcoming arc, but what I want to argue is that the arc isn't technically over. I mean, there was a clear separation between the Tournament of Power and the Moro arc, where there was literally no continuity between the two. Moro basically came out of nowhere. Yet, when the Galactic Patrol Prisoner arc starts, there are a series of events that very clearly led up to Frieza's return to the story and reintroduced the idea that there is an ever-present struggle between Frieza's empire, the Galactic Patrol, and all of the life in Universe 7 that is trying to not get caught in the middle of it. But what I want to point out is that the plot device that completely altered the balance of power in the universe was 7-3. Sure, Moro released all of the prisoners from the Galactic Patrol prison and destroyed countless planets, but all of his deeds were undone. Yet the one consequence that carried over was the criminal misuse of 7-3's data by the heaters. Again, with 7-3 acting no more than a lowly pawn. But I suppose if the Moro arc is the first act of a larger saga, and the Granola arc is the second act, then the third act is coming, and it's possible that the loose ends of the Granola saga will finally tie up in this upcoming storyline. And I believe that whatever storyline that may be, it will follow the singular theme of the last two sagas, which was that you can't take shortcuts to power. Moro absorbed an angel's power via 7-3's copy abilities and couldn't handle the power boost. Granola wished to become the strongest, and was surpassed in a few chapters. And Gas became the most powerful being in the universe, yet was killed by an opponent who trained for 10 years in another realm. You see, whatever's coming will follow that theme, and at the middle of it, I believe, personally, that 7-3 will play a crucial role in this trilogy. Is it far-fetched? Maybe a little bit. I gotta be honest. But just in the way that these past two arcs introduced the next arc before they were even over, and considering that Dragon Ball Super's writing has been planned out further ahead than Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z ever were, I think a resolution will come that will end the pre-DBZ era and kick off the post-Oob era of the series. But that's just my prediction. So as always, I'd like to know what you guys think. Am I onto something? Or has 7-3's involvement naturally come to an end? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, Funkers, I shall see yous down the road.